Good evening, everybody. Welcome, my branters. We have a really fun show for you all tonight. Returning champion astrologers, Emily Ridout and Michael Nebe Jr., a.k.a. the Peace Dealer. You know him, you love him. Uh, so, you know, I couldn't do an astrology show without getting Emily up in here. And it's been a while since we caught up with Michael. So probably already know both of these fellas and ladies. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, uh, Michael, how you been? How, how's it going? Uh, t remind everybody, you know, what, what you do and where your channel's at and all that. Um, well, nice to be back on here. I definitely, you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook, at The Peace Dealer, um, repping Mystical Illuminations. And uh, yeah, just been... Uh, champion gang. I love it. Just been personally, I hate to say it, not just going with the flow, but uh, really just unfolding this magical adventure of consciousness, um, walking into every single one of the cliches about spirituality um, that I've heard. And now it's like, damn, that was right. You know, everything you have is within you or, you know, your life is what you make it. And, you know, I remember being like, oh, yeah, OK, but no, nah, it's really than never. So oh, we're going to have to hear more about those uh, yeah. spiritual cliches you've walked into. <laughs> yeah, it's like slap me in the face. Well, I've really wanted you and Emily to meet. I have this like vision that she'll wind up on a peace talk with you one of these oh, nights because okay. you guys are both really, really knowledgeable and very intuitive astrologers. So, Emily, I know a lot of uh, our listeners already know you, but please introduce what you do, your work, you know, what you're excited about uh, to talk about tonight. Totally. Um, well, hey, everybody. and Hi, Michael. Um so I'm Emily Ridout. I'm an astro yoga specialist. For those of you guys who don't know me, um, you can find me on Instagram, on my website, which is myname.com. Um, you can also find um, the book that I have coming out in, well, in a couple weeks in stores or somewhere, <laughs> wherever you can buy published books, um, you know, and yeah, on the internet or in Oregon. Are you like picking a specific date for the book to come out to match the astrology? Well, I did. It's supposed to come out one, two, three, two, three, um, oh, cool. which is the day after the Lunar New Year and when the moon and Saturn are conjoining my Venus. So let's go. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Pretty fun. Um, but, you know, as far as things are concerned with the publisher and whatnot, it's also kind of a we'll, we'll see. Hopefully it hits that date, but... But I'm excited to talk about not that date in particular, but the upcoming year of the rabbit Aquarian ingress of Pluto into Aquarius equinox thing with with you guys today and and all the all the cool things that's coming up, because I think for most people, 2023 is going to be kind of a nuts year, but in a good way. <laughs> Agreed. I'm seeing that coming. Yeah, I like the year of the rabbit. I know we're not technically there yet because Chinese astrology is starts a different, you know, different beginning of the year. But I made this fun art for the show tonight. Nice. <laughs> Space rabbit. I just re uh, realized that the, the, the year of the rabbit. So that's interesting. I think I just found it out like two days ago or yeah, last night. That should be fun. I've been waiting for it for a while because I am a rabbit. So, do, what what did we just finish? Was it the dragon or monkey? Tiger, right? Tiger. Tiger. Oh snap! Okay. And then the rat was that twenty twenty? Uh, I'm, I'm in over my head with Chinese astrology. Uh, so twenty twenty two would have been the tiger. So twenty twenty before that would be. It was the ox, right? The ox, okay. Are the oxes right before the tigers, or is there another one in between them? Oh, that's a good question. All I all I know is that um, Takashi Six Nine had taken a stand during the year of the rat, and I thought that was really funny that they did that at the same time. So wow, I mean, 
I don't really know what the rabbit means, but yeah, I I do agree with the uh, this year being nuts for many people. Is the year the rabbit like time to have a lot of kids or something? <laughs> well, honestly, I'm in a little over my head if we're going to go deep into Chinese astrology, but there is some indication in at least in a couple systems of astrology that might indicate there will be a, a bit of a, a baby push coming up. Um, you know, against a backdrop of extreme baby ceasing, that's been sort of the norm, but you know, against the current backdrop, it does, it does mm -hmm. look like pregnancy might be on an uptick. Well, that's like the most rebellious thing now is have families and farm and grow your own food in a good, like that's basically like I filter what truther channels and uh, podcasts I like to listen to based on if they're presenting the solution of leave the big cities, have children and grow your own food. If that's if, like, if they're at least saying that that's a good idea, then I'm pro I'm in, you know, they're probably good people. Weird. Yeah. There's a big, there's a big inversion happening in society where things that used to be considered traditional have now become so out of the norm that doing them is its own act of rebellion. Yeah. And uh, it's it's interesting to see how that is exact to to like the opposite Pluto degree, right? Like when Pluto was in Cancer to Leo, it was literally opposite, which is interesting. I think we were just getting into like uh, the, the tradition, people rebelling against those same traditions that people want to embrace now. Totally. Well, Pluto and Leo is the baby boomer or the baby boom, right? And then Pluto and Cancer, a lot of the like World War II era, but like slightly too young in World War II, they were- That's true. They were the Cancerian yeah. Plutonians, I think. Oh, wow. Congratulations, Matt. Yeah, congratulations, oh, wow. Matthew, over on Rockman. He chatted and said, my wife and I just free birthed our son yesterday. That is legendary, but buddy, thank you for sharing that with us. And congrats. Congratulations. What's his name? All right. All right cool. All yeah, right. so uh what what uh you know what's the big theme for 2023 other than nuts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's a good question. Mm. Um, do you want to go first, Michael? I have my own. Sure. Um I feel like if we I've I've learned to embrace like uh naming timed events b based off Saturn or at least looking more like like letting Saturn be the time clock it doesn't have to be, right? But given that 2023 is going to be where we see it enter Pisces um and Pisces is the last zodiac sign and Saturn represents the world then to me, that's the beginning of the end of the world. So we're seeing like everything begin to change, but like everything since like the past 30 and 12 years, which should be uh, quite nuts. Yeah. So the end of the world as in like everything that's established and the way things have been overturning and rebuilding basically? Pretty much in light of uh, Neptune there, and uh, if you think of Saturn as order and, you know, Aries is the beginning, then this sets us up for a literal new world order in two years, uh, which is amazing to be able to track the apocalypse with Saturn. Uh, but yeah, everything that started in Saturn Capricorn, seeing the effects of which uh, I think, I think Emily, you kind of nailed it because nuts is actually the perfect word. I can only imagine like the effects will drive certain people nuts as far as having to adapt. But yeah, should be epic. Well, it's interesting too, that whole point about the year of the rabbit and maybe a lot of uh, rebellious uh, 
child having (laughs) because that's one of the things they tell you like you know your world economic forums and whatnot that uh you're don't have children you're killing the earth by having kids which is hilarious and retarded but (laughs) the uh the last big push of babies had their own name you know a generation called the baby boomers right and now as a lot of them are dying of suddenly and the (laughs) like i saw a tweet today that used car lots are filled with buicks that nobody wants and i'm not laughing about anybody that's lost a loved one i personally have myself but you know it's kind of interesting how baby boomers exit stage left you're the rabbit truthers having babies yeah especially after pointing out that was pluto leo and now we're seeing the opposite pluto like take its place that's so wild well, and yeah, so I know that um, <laughs> a lot of us will be hip to what you're talking about, but you know, I'd love any kind of like elaboration on like, you know, pl- what Pluto Leo means, what the opposite of that means. Hmm. Please, I, uh, I think you're going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say that millennials in general are the children of baby boomers, and if you look generationally yeah. at the influx of souls entering earth right there was a big push in the late 70s to early 90s of souls coming in in part heralds for this this new group that's about to be born which will be because the generation with so the generation that i'm talking about was like the people born with pluto and scorpio right? Probably, maybe both of you. Um, And then those children, these children that will be coming in um, a little bit this year, and then again, in the following years to come, those are the ones that are going to dismantle the Aquarian Plutonian themes when they have their Saturn return. So all of these Aquarian themes that have to be dismantled in their current iteration are about to come up right, as Pluto goes in. And so these kids are going to be born into a world, right, where where Pluto and Aquarius goes crazy, which we can elaborate on later if you want, but like maybe people already know what's going to happen or what they, I'm sure people have already intuited what's going to happen, but um, there will be potentially, I think these kids that are being born will be the ones to really dismantle that, even though millennials are starting. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I feel like the millennials are kind of going to pave the way for that. And and to answer your question, Chance, you know, I think President Trump represents Pluto Leo. And then you have uh, us as millennials, right? Pluto Scorpio, which is like 83 to, to uh, 95. And, and then you have... Uh, Pluto Aquarians that are about to be born from like 24 right now or 20 and 23 to maybe like the 50s or 40s. So uh, I think it's a good question because if we think about that 50s period of right before the hippie generation and, and those initial rebellions, I mean, history taught us, they taught us that in history is the period where, um, they were pushing conservative values on people, at least in America. And, um, you know, as far as the gender norms and gender roles of a man does this, a woman does this, uh, which is very interesting because that was where you saw the whole uh, man being the breadwinner and the woman being the stay at home mom. And I didn't realize how now, like you see the opposite of that being more, fought for or 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 dealt against where you're having increasing amounts of people like uh having to deal with being a stay-at-home mom versus having a career of their own right but uh i didn't realize how now there's enough time that's passed to to take into account the pluto scorpios and everything in between that like and how like that kind of pushed forward uh, but I mean, there's so many possibilities too. the way like Pluto Scorpio clashes with Pluto Leo. 
um, Pluto Aquarius will probably clash with Pluto Scorpio. So, I mean, yeah, it'd be interesting. I, based on what you said, Emily, I, I kind of felt like I kind of took it into perspective where it's like we only have like 30 years until they come of age and then it's the end of the world, the revenge of the baby geniuses or something like that. But yeah. I don't think the world will, you know, we always, people like talk about it, like the world's going to explode, but what's going to happen is the thing that's going to die is not all the people or the environment or something. It's going to be the things that are not serving where humanity is going, right? So even though it's painful to, to dismantle systems that we're used to in a certain way, because we get all in our stuck in our ways, it's also going to be really positive potentially because those same systems that we see causing suffering and harm, um, these souls are very likely to start to dismantle. And even though it's going to take like 300 years probably for everything to kind of settle in a bit yeah. more, um, the likelihood is that even already, even despite what the news may say, things are actually getting much better and that the shadow elements we're seeing right coming up and really being forced in our consciousness is the reintegration of the shadow that I think the Plutonian generation is really working with right now and has yeah. been for some time. And even though sometimes it might feel like people are at battle, even like ideological battle, that what's happening is a renegotiation of consciousness on the earth plane. And so it's not... It's not bad, I don't think. And it's also like the people, even if you look at someone and you're like, wow, they have a completely different ideology than me. I completely disagree with them. In fact, I think they're causing harm, right? That's a thought I hear a lot of people echoing that those people are actually not your enemy. And while it might be your task in this life to voice a different opinion or to take a separate stance or to even like fight the good fight in a particular area that that person in a certain way on a certain level, right, is not your enemy. Now they might feel like your enemy in a, in a remote circumstance, but there's a sort of like interpersonal alchemy that we're all doing and what it is is a fight ultimately for our consciousness to evolve and grow. Oh, she says she has- that's interesting. I feel like Pluto and Libra have had to uh, carry every, everyone so far. Like when the Pluto has been squaring their Pluto, although it's been very stressful, I can imagine, uh, which makes, once again, having Pluto Scorpio interesting because now we're going to have the square. So, uh, yeah, that, mm -hmm. that should be very interesting. And uh, I've now been studying like Pluto... Uh, Pluto Sun people who kind of represent the each generation were like uh, Lil Wayne, Eminem, Kanye. These are icons of the Pluto uh, Libra. Um, I'm kind of looking at Drake now, who has Pluto Scorpio, um, and now he's in the news for being listed as a potential witness in the XXX trial. Something that I would have never really taken serious. Like I don't really believe there's anything more to that. I mean, there can be, but uh, I think it's a really big sneak peek into the type of potential, you know, drama that could be, um, even if that in and of itself is just more sensational, it just kind of gives you an idea of like <laughs> the extreme nature of what's getting ready to be exposed moving forward. And uh, another thing though, that I really do, uh, believe because i i really am under the impression that this is going to be very positive i think a lot of people are going to see um the beginnings of great social change and um you know a, a lot of a lot a, a a a lot breaking through a lot of the tension pluto capricorn gave as far as like oh you know this is getting exposed that's getting exposed i think instead of things just being in the air you know a lot of the fog is clearing out uh, with with this Pisces transit over the next couple of years. But um, what do you feel about the whole notion of mass extinction events? And despite how positive 
or or like because I, I do believe that, too. I even love how you said, like, it'll take, like, 300 years to really integrate all this. I truly believe that, too, as far as, like, uh, the domino effects that are kicking off now. But, um, yeah, do you feel like they'll be worse than last time, potentially, or or not at all? Maybe we might see, like, a reduced version. Well, so when we're thinking about Pluto this time, because it's in Aquarius, we have to pay attention to Saturn and Uranus, because if Pluto is in Aquarius, he's answering to where Saturn and Uranus are, Mm -hmm. right? And so Uranus, of course, is in Taurus. And in the past, we have seen with Uranus and Taurus events that have caused increased human suffering, the dismantling of financial systems, things like this. Um, And so in extreme environmental conditions. And so something i mean there's so much with this transit right the the potential creation of of a utilitarian society which has so many issues with it uh the potential overreach of technology the potential erasure of the individual society of course those things won't last right but they might be tried to be implemented but then with uranus right uranus is a planet of heaven like the heavenly state And most Mm. people fear Uranus transits because it is such a flash and such a intense movement that happens. Um, But with Uranus and Taurus, the potential is to envision heaven on earth and with every dismantling that happens to replace it with a more harmonious heavenly state, right? So we have that going on. And then Saturn, you know, moving into Pisces is also a state of dismantling and dissolving consciousness. So, yeah. that, you know, it could go either, it could go either way. This mm. is one of the things I'm curious to. Yeah. I like that as far as it can go either way. Like that's, that's a big, with the North Node in Gemini and now with Saturn and Pisces too, I feel like it's not really set in stone. Like it really does depend on. I think it'll go it, different ways for different people. Exactly too. Yeah, how does a collectively respond to what's happening? But that's. Well, I want to throw. I want to weigh in on the mass extinction idea too. Mm -hmm. That one of the things that I've been really changing my view about is that idea of extinction and what is life? (laughs) Like what? What is this place we're in? Because if we're gonna take on board some of the philosophy, occultism, hermeticism, specifically, the very important law that everything is mental, that this is a mental plane, but everything, you know, menta- everything's mental. Every, all planes are then, you know, what, what is it what, that we call extinction? Yeah. It is that something is no longer in our perception. We don't perceive it as present in in our environment, but you know, as I go further in my understanding, I see like, first of all, that there are two directions that our consciousness can go. It can constrict and it can expand. And that that constriction comes about by fear. And that when we fear the number of possibilities that we're willing to see and accept narrows down and narrows down until finally there's just one possibility. And it has to be that way. Otherwise, we don't feel like things are going to be okay. And then as we love more, we see the potential and the, what, you know, the object of what we love. We want to see the potentials that it can choose, expand. And so there's a wider range, wider bandwidth. And on top of that, there's been like certain people I've talked to, renegade scientists, citizen scientists, you could call them like Matt Powers, who have been demonstrating with microscopy that, you know, organisms come into existence, at least on the micro level, when the conditions are right for them to thrive. Like literally thermophiles appearing in a compost heap that is sealed and kept up, you know, nothing can get into it. And they just are manifesting into existence in the compost where they would thrive. So, you know, when it comes to nature and all the range of parts and places of the world that nobody's looking (laughs) right now, like, I think that things don't really go extinct. We just lose sight of them as we narrow our bandwidth of perception down into a more and more reduced fear state. So like, when I say that it could go different ways for different people, you might have people living in an urban environment and like they don't see birds anymore 
the pigeons are all gone. <laughs> no more squirrels. Mass extinction. <laughs> People are dropping like flies around them too. But then you might have like the homesteaders who are seeing new animals that nobody's ever seen before as their possibilities widen. I, I, you know, it sounds a little like wishy-washy to somebody that's kind of locked into a fully material view of the reality. But just looking at like I have friends in Arizona where the, the, you know, there's a strong, there's strong evidence to suggest that the stuff they've been doing with orgone technology there to disrupt the cell phone tower EMF fence oh. is actually bringing back life forms that didn't, that were gone, that were thought to be extinct. Like, organite? yeah, they're like, wow. they're, they're busting towers with organite and changing the frequency um, quality of the frequency that these towers are putting off. And like, They've been making it rain in Arizona, more rain than the state's ever had for years now. Like, it's just, they're just getting tons of monsoons. And, like, you know, jaguars are coming back into the region. Uh, they're they're finding new forms of insects that they didn't have before. Like, life, stuff that was extinct is just, like, showing up because of the you conditions. You right. something for me for sure. Like, the whole, because uh, I'm, I'm learning more that Aquarius represents a lot frequencies, right? If especially Aquarius that is supposed to be alien. So, uh, and Aquarius taught me that uh, alien is truly, you have the real alien, which might be like a, a, a being outside of this Earth's atmosphere, especially if there's like really other Earth-like planets. But then Aquarius taught me that a, a, a true alien is like a frequency or something that's like out of this dimension. It's literally out of this world. And, uh, we don't really see frequencies, right? But like, they still very much so affect us. And everything that you're saying right now, kind of, it's almost as if Pluto Aquarius might uh, help us become more aware or knowledgeable of the effects of frequencies in our life. Because I mean, you say something like this, and it's very easy for, you know, the average person to just kind of believe or not even be aware of this type of dynamics that you know, frequencies can even influence stuff like that. That's amazing. But then what if what if people are aware of how it's being used against them? And because uh, I actually even saw this TikTok or or which is amazing, right? The Internet TikTok right now. Is, but I kind of saw this one video of someone wearing a tinfoil hat and she was all saying, like, you know, ever since I started wearing this, uh, you know how like you say something and then your phone shows you the ad just like that stopped happening once i wore this tinfoil hat it's like oh snap like no tinfoil is so old news you need silver threaded hat like silver. <laughs> you can look just like a regular hat i've got one in, in the other room the silver is way you know it's better it's a better oh. vibe to <laughs> but that's that's real i think that like maybe even that was what was up with uh or one of the aspects of why the royals were wearing crowns and shit oh that's real you know, yeah. protect them from some kind of Protect the influence, but you know, in terms of frequencies, the the thing people that I want people to know is like I'm not trying to make the boogeyman out of the EMF of cell phone towers or your mm. computer or whatever. That stuff does have an effect, especially. But it's like it's like anything else. It's your level of health, strength, or weakness is what's going to determine what kind of effect it has on you. And in terms of like organite, your aura is like an organite field. You know, if you have a strong R, your boundaries are good. You like, <laughs> I'm going to repeat this again. I'm probably going to say this for the rest of my life, but like the full armor of God is keeping your own energy in your own battery. Yeah. And that's a, a great Owen Benjamin quote. Really good one. Shout out to Owen Benjamin. Yeah. Hell yeah. He's like the new Alex Jones to me. <laughs> He's like the not, the, the not controlled opposition Alex, Alex Jones. Yeah. That's why I said the new Alex Jones because I was like, oh, okay, Alex is. I mean, I don't, I don't want to talk any crap, but like, yeah, I now see why William Cooper said what he said about Alex Jones a long time ago. I still think he's Bill Hicks. I'm not going, I'm not going <laughs> to change my mind. I think he's Bill Hicks. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Yeah, Emily, you want to weigh in? We just dropped a lot of stuff out there. Well, I don't know who any of those people are, but. <laughs> Even Alex Jones. <laughs> I think I might have heard of him. Is he like an alien guy? No, he's just like uh, the angry Infowars banging on the desk. The globalists. Yeah. Um, I, don't know. I have a tendency OG conspiracy to ignore, guy. I have a tendency to ignore all people. Um, 
So it's fine. Why? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the la la la. Um, but I would just say I have a silver lined hat too. I have a couple of them, and I agree they're pretty great. And but it is true, and. It's funny you bring up the armor of God. It makes it takes me back to like church days with that Bible verse, right? That's like whatever it is, like the armor of truth and the the something of hope. the girdle of righteousness or who knows what. Yeah, there's yeah. like multiple pieces of it. Exactly. Um, but I would say that it is important to protect your aura. Um, not a popular thing to say all the time because there's a lot of things that we do recreationally that might poke holes in our auras. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to, and sometimes you do want to poke a hole in your aura if your aura is so dense that you're like collapsing in on yourself like a black hole. Um, but that's okay. But I agree with you about the aura thing. And, and, and you know, in a world where there is a lot of frequency trying to usurp your mind, um, and where there are a lot of entities that could access you potentially, you know, both physical entities like, I don't know, weird poison that's in food, and also just frequencies that are around you that might not be positive and might put you in sort of a lower frequency state. It is really important to figure out ways, um, even though all people ultimately have our energetic bodies connected to one another. It is really important to figure out a way within the collective to start to transform your piece of the collective auric energy field into something really positive because that does spread to others. And I work with a lot of my clients on that, just like, what are the things you do to fix? The thing and especially happened. the people closest to you, like family, direct family members, your R's are very connected. It's Quick true. Question. It's do, true. Do you happen to, are you, uh, do you happen to have your rising in Scorpio or uh, do you have anything connected to Pluto directly or, or Virgo? Um, I do have a south node in Virgo and a Pluto in Scorpio as previously. Oh, <laughs> nice. Okay. Yes. But I, I got that cancer rising. Cancer rising. Okay. I, I asked because I noticed a lot of um, most most people who have um, like yo or who are really like into yoga, I noticed they really have like prominent Pluto placements or like water sign, Scorpio or cancer. You know, I actually have noticed that too. Now that I think back on all the people I'm friends with that are the most crazy about yoga, a lot of Scorpios in there. Wow. <laughs> I started noticing the pattern. I was like, wait, is this like a thing? But that's really good to know. There are certain things. You seem like a Capricorn. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Damn. Yeah, but my moon is on Saturn and Capricorn. That's yeah, so Emily's like Emily's thing is teaching people how to do yoga that is tailor made to their personal chart oh, in the time of year. Um, that is so needed. That's really dope. Yeah, I learned that Pluto is the Kundalini aspect. Um, so I've been looking into that. Oh yeah, the Kundalini people love Pluto. Well, they they do a lot with it. I I like the Kundalini people a lot. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Those are the ones that I usually, the Kundalini yoga ones are usually the Scorpio, Pluto Scorpio, like rising or oh. something. Yep. Yeah. Because Scorpio, so prominent Scorpio in your chart indicates an understanding of the deep need for internal subtle body work that's contained. Mm -hmm. And the Kundalini oh, wow. people will literally, like, they'll teach class where you're supposed to keep your eyes closed the whole time. And a lot of what you're doing is like, I teach at a couple studios, but I teach hot yoga, which is like flow yoga sometimes. And the people who come to hot yoga, you know, they want, they want energy work, but they also want to work out, right? Mm -hmm. The Kundalini people, they do sometimes get a workout with some of those things that are just exhausting on your body that you do, but they're doing them for particular energetic outcomes. So there's Kundalini practice you can do to make more money. 
there's kundalini practice you can do to um to destroy your ego there's kundalini practice you can do to wake up certain centers in your brain and those exist in other forms of yoga but it's very rare that we do them in public classes oh wow that's awesome so I, like, I like the kundalini people that's a tough i've i've definitely always been interested in yoga until it comes time to actually do yoga and it's like oh my gosh these postures are there's so much discipline needed it's like oh wow like uh it's it's definitely i it's definitely something i want to approach more uh i guess respectfully but kundalini yoga is one of the ones that i wanted to jump into as far as like just working with the kundalini but i heard i hear a lot of different things about it but yeah definitely uh in light of pluto aquarius i feel like the we we get to see a lot more of these things I, I was going to say go mainstream, but I guess return back to its prominence in the way it used to be, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, it, it does seem like right now there's not much. It There's a lot of what appears to be innovation in these sort of communities, but it seems okay. like a lot of it is actually remembering. It's mm -hmm. just it's been forgotten so long that now it seems like innovation. Like sometimes people ask me if I made up Astro Yoga and I'm like, no, <laughs> it's thousands of years old. Um, but you know, all, that's happening all across the board with certain understandings of, well, chance you do the I Ching, um, a resurgence of, of knowledge of the tarot in broader culture, as opposed to some like, there's been a release of maybe knowledge that was kept to the inner schools of some of those mystery traditions, more information coming out and commonly known, a lot of things going on. That's so true. Well, uh, while well, we're in Capricorn right now, so, you know, what's a good, uh, can you describe some astro yoga for our knees or our joints or whatever else Capricorn might be? you know, assisted with? Way to know it rules the knees. Um, so Capricorn rules the bones. And right now we have this Mercury retrograde going back through Capricorn. So it is a good time to take care of your bones. And this is just for whatever your Capricorn placements are, um, using your bones well. So grounding the thigh bones, um, also understanding that, that, the, the bones are more important than we think. Like we understand they're important, right? Like they hold our body in space. We abuse them to a certain degree as in we ignore them and then we just expect them to work. But also healthy bone is fluid on the internal plane, right? Which is the same thing why Capricorn has the fish tail. And so that's the area of the body where your blood, most of your blood is made. Most of your blood is made in your pelvic bones, what your, your breastbone and... Mm, one other bone. Um, and so those areas are really important to nourish. So people could work, I would just strengthen around the knees and the bones. So warrior two would be a good one to do if you're starting. And if you want to do something restful because it's mercury retrograde right now, you could literally lie down with a pillow under your knees and a weighted blanket or something heavy resting on your thighs to ground the thigh bones and to create optimal knee alignment. So that's, that's what I do. Yes. And I've noticed that this mercury retrograde was like immediately more noticeable. <laughs> Maybe it was just me, but as soon as it hit the shadow, it was like a bunch of, uh, it was more on the tech issues side for me, but like it was more intense than normal. I don't know. Anyone else? I uh, fixed my broken phone screen, and then uh, the very moment I came back home, I dropped my phone and cracked my screen again. Um, <laughs> and mind you, getting the phone screen when I ordered it, uh, I came in the store. They said uh, it didn't come in. And then I came in the next day, and they said, we got the wrong part. You have to come in in two days. Uh, so yeah, also even the, the flight that I was supposed to fly back in on the flight delayed, like 
three times in one night. But I had driven the night, the, the day of, so I didn't even need to fly. But yeah, it's been vicious. Mercury retrograde has been hitting more. I mean, I know that's subjective to say, but definitely been uh, vicious. I mean, I'm learning not to blame Mercury, but <laughs> I still do anyway. I'm just like, come on. This is, this is vicious. This is crazy. But yeah, I'm sure there's a lesson in it. Maybe. So, okay, I, you know, you brought up the I Ching, Emily, and it's been a while since I did this. So, on the stream, <laughs> so I decided, uh, why not throw some coins? So, I threw some 2023 20, coins for the I Ching. Nice. And yeah, it is kind of, an, it, you know, if this is accurate divination, <laughs> maybe a little bit intense. So, uh, when you throw coins with the I Ching, you often will get two hexagrams, not one. So the first hexagram we got, and then it's changing into another one, is uh, 20 or 44. 44. Oh. Which is the attraction of opposites. So this is when the gang energy, you know, like the creative force, the masculine, is above air or wind, or they call it the gentle in the I Ching. So this represents like, <clears throat> this represents like the magnetism of, um, a passionate, seductive type energy. <laughs> it can be, you know, it, it's representative of sexual union and it can be like in a good way of like, you're meeting them halfway, you know, and, uh, and it can also be kind of more of a uh, falling to temptation. It can go either way. <laughs> so what this, you know, what interesting about this is I think like in terms of how that could apply to 2023 is how I don't know. I saw that, like, uh, back to Owen Benjamin. I watch him a lot lately. He was talking about, like, the uh, <laughs> the rock, paper, scissors of uh, normies beat schizos, schizos beat psychopaths, psychopaths beat normies. <laughs> wow, that is hilarious. That is very <laughs> Owen Benjamin. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, the schizos is lovingly. It's just the people that see more than other people see to the point where they get a little nutty. And that they can, um, you know, they can see what the psychopaths are doing at the top of this pyramid, uh, but the the normies can't. But the normies can kind of bar the uh, the schizo out of society. So that's why they beat the schizo. <laughs> and obviously, the psychopath just dominates the normie, and they don't even know they're being controlled. So anyway, why I bring that up is because like in this attraction of opposite Yo. sense, I think like twenty twenty three. Revenge um, of the schizo. <laughs> <laughs> I think our, well, I really think that there will be, um, you know, a need for, there will be maybe like a, a seductive aspect of those of us who have been, you know, woken up by the events of 2020 to now or woke up sooner to what, you know, what's really going on in the world. There might be some things that come, come across in 2023, hardships or uh, difficulties that might lead to sort of a, a temptation or a magnetism to just sort of like shut off all the stuff you just learned, get back into your cubicle, don't keep, put your head back down. Um, you know, and that's like sort of the, uh, the temptation when I say, why well, I'm bringing this up is cause it's like the attraction of opposites in the sense that the, uh, the normies and the schizos, they really need each other right now. <laughs> like the people that have woken up to some of the truth going on in the world and have some data about how to not be, uh, destroyed by the psychopaths, they also still need, you know, the community that is the general population of the normies, just as much as the normies need to like learn from what the schizos have figured out about this shit. So they're like the, the best case scenario I see would be like those parties meeting halfway <laughs> and building bigger communities oh, and yeah. away from the psychopaths. Oh, but, psychopaths. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> but, but see, the, you know, to, but not to fall matter. to the temptation of to like just go right back into your cubicle and and shut off all the stuff that you figured out. And the psychopaths know how to blend in and behave like normies. So, <laughs> yeah, they just all, as long as they stay away from the schizos, yeah. you can see them. <laughs> uh, well, I'm a, I personally I'm on the team schizo, but. Yeah, I think some people don't have a choice. They just, it is what it is. You can't unsee it once you see. Yeah. <laughs> but the uh, the changing line, this is interesting. Changing line made the yin card or the yang card or the yang energy of the top of the hexagram shift to 
the heaven or the the plurality as i like to call it so this makes it into hexagram 28 which is called hey. excess okay so this is what to watch out for i think big time in 2023 is like breaking point you know stress overload exhaustion the breaking point specifically like worry obsessiveness and gluttony are what to n not carry with us into 2023 mm. and that it's it may even be inevitable that certain aspects of what are coming down the line are going to bring about some of that feeling of exhaustion and overload and you, like we really need to be aware of when we like to notice it whenever like maybe that's one too many rocks on my backpack <laughs> you know and like start lightening our own load and not stay in this energy because the thing about the I Ching is it's always flowing forward. There's always the next change, the next change. So don't get stuck on this point of excess. Watch out for it when it comes. It's part of all of the 64 hexagrams are a part of the configurations that your consciousness is going to take multiple times throughout your life journey. So, you know, it's not that this is a bad omen or something. It's just that, like, it's giving you the clue of, like, look out for this. Uh, look out for obsessiveness, worries, <laughs> especially maybe gluttony is maybe more, more my thing to worry about because I'm a seven in the Enneagram. But anyway. Um, Sounds like Jupiter and Taurus. <laughs> yeah, like I figured you guys would have some astro gravy about uh, that I Ching pull. It does That's sound so. like Jupiter and Taurus. Yeah, really interesting. And yeah, if anything, based off of uh, what said shared earlier about Pluto Aqua, um, it, 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 I kind of like the sequencing of it. I feel like the, the first part of everything is um, kind of preparing for Uranus and Gemini, which is which what's conjuncting Saturn in the, the, the early 30s, late 20s, uh, is most definitely a game changer. I feel like Uranus and uh, Saturn conjunct the end of Gemini going into Cancer is going to mark like integrating a new society and and us getting ready to push forward with flying cars and like new technology and stuff like that. So the road towards then might be where we're seeing the end of one era coming into another era, um, kind of growing going through all these changes i don't want to be too morbid or negative because i mean i'm sure a, a a major theme that i'm picking up if anyone has ever seen the watchmen um you have that whole dilemma where like the the bad guy or osmandius is he really a bad guy where i kind of see the elites as like the elites right as like kind of taking that stance where they feel like we have to do what we're doing because we're saving billions of people. Yeah, maybe we might have to end the lives of millions, but you know, I think more insight into that might be revealed where, um, which I don't necessarily agree that that's a good or bad thing, but just kind of coming into more, uh, awareness what if people make the realization that certain things that well i'm not gonna even like uh infer that but yeah you know just kind of coming into that type of perspective and uh seeing the differences and how people literally war over that with their philosophies and that coming to a head um but at the same time all of that might sound like the prospect of war or the prospect of all this stuff might sound horrible and it can end up being a very positive thing because it pushes so much great change. So yeah, I, de I definitely um, am, am really looking at things in not a doomsday prophecy kind of way, like, oh, this is going to be the end of this and the end of that, instead of more just looking at it more positively, like, oh, this is the end of this, this is the end of that, like, we get to start something new, you know, but yeah. Yeah, that is an important way to look at well, what I think overall, like the best way to look at any of the suffering, manipulation, any, of the, you know, how I, how I have balanced out my position on the triangle as the schizo corner <laughs> is that I, I have realized that no matter how bad intentioned or good intentioned the uh, bad behavior of the psychopath or the normie 
that at the end, everything that happens serves God or serves good. And even if it seems bad at first, I like by that. the end, everything is eventually serving good and usually right. pretty quick, too. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's a really good way to see it. It requires some kind of discipline, but yeah. And I mean, if anything, you know, the way uh, I like that you said it's going to happen really fast. I think that's a, a good theme of this year. If anything, um, the, the, the literally like right now, the next three months, uh, given the nature of the outer planets, it's like we start January uh, or the, the years off with the most drama or with the most like uh, setting, you know, whatnot. So that by spring, we're dealing with all the squares to that and uh, should be very spicy. Oh, that Pluto shift is actually right at the spring equinox, which I think is a little intense because that's my birthday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's coming right after Jupiter makes a little jet so yeah first season is definitely uh gonna be fire um which okay now what do you both think about nostradamus's prediction because i didn't i just realized that he predicted uh uh, civil war in the u.s and then a world economic crash and then the death of a russian leader um which is very wild because a lot of his predictions that i heard as far as like what he felt i was like this sounds very 2023 but like f those specific ones i was like wow that'll if he's right about that that'll be like insane interesting to say the least but yeah I, I, know, I just uh, like did a quick Google search of Nostradamus 2023 cannibalism. <laughs> no way. He said that too. Cannibalism. I mean, that's just what is on the top of the Google and who knows. Uh, but that's interesting that's because cannibalism is becoming pushed as a, a fashionable thing. Believe it or not. Where? Wow, that's crazy. Oh, someone will source it for me. Someone sourced some recent article from like a New York Times or a similar publication where, you know, they're kind of like weighing cannibalism. Maybe Tired it will the world. That's, a, that's a real me. thing. I mean, Soylent Green was set in like 2022, the movie. Damn. Maybe it's just a playbook that some, some people have had access to. <laughs> cannibalism is so 2028 ish <laughs> it's not even <laughs> close <bro. laughs> after there's worldwide famine and now that's all that's left no it, it'll never get that bad i don't think but i mean yeah i think we're gonna see all of this happen so fast but i think the twist to this because there's a twist in all things it's like on paper we can we might see all this on paper right and be like wow like this is horrible like this war is happening or this crash is happening but i feel like it's true as uh hard times make strong people you know this could be like some of the most exhilarating times in our life that we look back on like you know things got a lot tougher here but this is where we started to see this freedom this is where the revolution kicked in you know what i mean so I think the actual experience of it versus what it'll look, I think people can take what it looks like on paper to to have people be afraid and to evoke all this fear versus how it'll really be experienced, which I think will be the twist. I think it'd be amazing, even though, you know, on paper, it looks like this horrible thing happened and, and not to undermine how bad it could be, but just so no one gives into fear, if anything. Yeah, and you were talking about Uranus and Saturn in Gemini. And, yeah. you know, something about Gemini energy is people are always like, oh, it's twins, right? It's Pain and Abel, it's Castor and Pollux. One brother's going to murder the other. But Gemini is also another energy, right? Gemini is also the energy, which if you look in the tarot, is the energy that not only teaches you to have harmonious higher self relationships with other people, but also teaches you how to have harmonious higher self relationships with your subconscious and conscious minds. Right. And 
it teaches you the mechanism by which you can either upward spiral or downward spiral. And so with Gemini, it's very tempting to look to the world of multiplicity for the answer. And to some extent we do that, but really you should wait for Libra to do that because Libra is the one that's going to take right measure of the situation and then know what the outcome will be, right? That's its whole thing is looking at What's the karma of the entire world? And what is the outcome of these collective actions being taken? Versus in Gemini, and this is what we saw in 2020 when the North Node was in Gemini, right? Is we saw people mistaking um, their beliefs, their opinions, their piecemeal perspectives for the ultimate truth. And then we saw these people like having a piece of a perspective and being like, but everybody agrees with me. It's the ultimate truth. And of course, uh, there was a lot of disagreement um, on many topics in 2020 and a lot of <laughs> you saw it. You were there. Um, and so what we're looking at is, you know, you could look at these predictions and be like, oh, my gosh, it's horrible. But if you look at the predictions too much, you co-facilitate their eventual outcome versus right. if you look at predictions and then you decide, you know what, the whole world can do that. I'm not doing that. I'm All doing right. this, right? Um, it, many people would look at that. They would say, it's rubbish. We're not doing that. I'm not doing it, right? And of course, you know, there could be circumstances where you're not able to take a stand without extreme duress. There's, you know, there's duress, certain yeah, that's true. Yourself in and, um, and you have to make choices for your own life. But enough people, you know, people didn't magically become bad. Like these things that externally look bad are popping up so that the goodness of people can say, you know what, this is, you know, this is far enough. Maybe this is ridiculous. <clears throat> we're just not becoming cannibals, right? Or you, we're just not, whatever. It's not so hard to say like, I don't think I'd like to eat human flesh, right? It's not so hard. Um, and so it's also not so hard to say, you know what? Um, there's probably a solution beyond war. You know what? There's probably a solution beyond, you know, these sorts of things. Now, will that come to pass? I don't know. But you answered my question though, because I was I was starting to one thing that I've really started to break through into and embrace more is, you know, manifestation and, and being a creator of your own world and and seeing how globally and collectively, unconsciously or consciously, people are starting to adopt this type of stuff and be aware of how uh, our subconsciouses are manipulated to accept certain events as real. So we co-create this type of stuff with them. So I was wondering, like, especially in light of predictions and stuff, uh, how much of that is the collective coming into consciously choosing what we want to create, you know, and, and does things being up in the air? And I think that was an amazing answer um, of really just deciding, you know, what you're going to be a part of, what you're going to co-create. Because a lot of these things do kind of sound like self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and it'd be interesting to notice that play with a lot of these forced narratives, which I think you nailed as far as this extreme duress. And that could be a uh, that could be an issue. But I guess in light of what you said, we can also choose to overcome that. So, yeah, it's, it's a tricky business, but it's true. Like if you don't. So in the tarot, right, we have the magician, which is the card that shows the aspect of the life force, which is the difference between life and death in the embodied state, right? And that's your attention. And so what you attend to is what you create. Like that's, you know, that's the whole thing. But um, to really say, you know what, I'm not putting, I mean, I haven't read these predictions. You know, you're like, I'm not putting my attention on that. I'm putting my attention on the highest source I can, right? Personally, I don't have like some magic psychic access to the higher consciousness potency that I'm able to directly access. So for me, I use astrology, right? And meditation and whatever. But you, um, you know, when you look directly at that, you're going to get way more information than if you, than if you listen to someone who's predicting doom, 
right? You're gonna, you're just gonna get more, I think, a clearer, sure a clearer, more direct understanding. Yeah, definitely very true. So I, I'm still, I, you know, I kind of want to think more about this part of 2023 where Saturn is in Pisces. You know, that does seem like, and we did talk about that, like the uh, end of the old order, new order coming, but <laughs> like Pisces is kind of like the end, you know, of the cycle. And then Saturn is kind of like the Grim Reaper. So yeah, um, I've heard some people <laughs> talking about 2023, actually, again, I know I keep referencing Noah and Benjamin, but this just kind of fits. It's kind of funny that they were, uh, they're talking about it on his stream, him and his community, and they decided on what they were going to call 2023 was the year of the harvest. And I'm over here like, they don't even know that Saturn in Pisces is happening. I was about to say they don't know that, and they, they, that's an appropriate name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a very appropriate name. Um, Wow. I, I really like that. And if you if we take it and, and, and that's what really uh, Saturn's been teaching me as far as like timing and, and like, you know, cardinal fixed mutable. So uh, I've been learning to embrace more the one, two, three step that transits kind of show us from cardinal to mutable, the beginning of the season, the end of the season and specifically 2019 to 2021 Saturn and Capricorn which uh, really kind of kicked that off. And then 2021 and 2023 sat in Aquarius, which kind of strengthened that. And now we're literally harvesting those effects. So in, re in order to really appreciate what's happening, and that's what I really enjoy about Saturn, because you literally reap what you sow. And it's not necessarily, uh, it's literally as simple as what did you do then? Because that the effects of that is going to happen, and it's based on your decision. So it's it's everything you have to take responsibility for, and of course Pisces allows us to adapt to the effects of what occurs. So I think this is going to be a masterclass for a lot of people on how to really work with timing to see a lot of things, and then especially everyone with Pluto Scorpio. I feel like that's going to be amazing as far as like blossoming our respective powers and uh lessons we've learned so my yeah. like my big lessons with saturn that came in 2022 which hopefully was like useful for you know maybe i learned this to be ready for this uh saturn and pisces thing in 2023 and i think this relates to the excess thing as well yeah is that okay so yo i brought this up before but we have one word for time. Time is what we call the measured ticking of the hands on the clock. Also, we're connecting that to the cycles of the uh, the planets. <laughs> but the Greeks, they had multiple words for things that we only have one word for. So they had the measured time like we use, and they called it chronos. And then they also had subjective time, which they called kurios. And subjective time is a whole different thing than because, you know, if you've ever done psychedelics, you realize that you could actually live lifetimes potentially in a few minutes. So yeah. <laughs> it's like very subjective. And we know this is a mental plane. We know that consciousness, uh, our our perspective is like this bottleneck that it either widens or, or shrinks. You know, it's an aperture. Right. Yeah. So I think that part of what's going to put people, you know, part of like what will get you out of excess or put you in excess if you want to get out of excess and into success <laughs> then you know finding your way for out of chronos time and into you know saturn and pisces is like let's maybe that's for some of us going to be the end of being ruled by chronos time and you can get into the subjective time because it's like again when you do when you have your emily i'm sure you can attest to this right like you have your practices of uh, yoga, for example, and meditation, and they take a certain amount of time <laughs> in in the clock time. But then, you know, how much more productive are you if you sharpen the axe, so to speak, as like my Qigong teacher likes to call it, uh, before you go about doing your other tasks versus if you're like, I don't have time for, I don't have time to do this meditation i don't have time to do this yoga because i'm so busy 
you know, I feel like I get, and I'm not, that doesn't mean I'm perfect at it. <laughs> like I didn't, uh, I don't always do it, but I feel like I get more, I'm more productive in the time I have whenever I'm doing the practices that sharpen me and that are good for me. And so like, I think that's more the, that's a way that you can experience the subjectivity of time that like, when you really think about why you get, are able to get a certain amount accomplished in one day, but not in another and like, where did the time go? That feeling. But then on another day, you're having fun, packing it, packing in so many different activities. And you, somehow it all happens in one day, right? Like we've all had a weekend, maybe like a music festival or something that felt like two weeks of time. And we've all had a weekend that we were dreading going back to work on Monday morning. And we like blinked and it was over. <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking maybe the, uh, maybe 2023 for some of us can be a, a year that we more step into that curious curious which sounds like curious which i find interesting yeah. uh interesting. subjective flow of time and that maybe a way to do that is to take the time for ourselves to do what is best and right for ourselves first and foremost and like stuff that does expand and open our aperture of consciousness so that we have more fluidity flexibility space like when you're meditating you're literally creating space in your consciousness and i feel like that creates space in all dimensions of consciousness including time that's amazing yeah, I, th I think you're spot on with the idea of giving so with saturn and pisces right saturn is actually the secret key to the zodiac right it's like the key to the light we're always trying to access the sun and the moon right but who rules the domiciles opposite the sun and the moon? Well, it's Saturn. He's in charge of the experience of light yeah. in a embodied state, right? So that's really important. And with him in Pisces, it's the experience of creating specificity for the practice of letting go and releasing control. So if you are like, I'm giving myself 20 minutes, I don't know, to lie on the floor. Great. You're doing it, right? And so there's this like, there's this key, which is human beings happen to show up in a place where Saturn is the time lord, right? And and not just time, but form and function, right? The fact that you have an identity, the fact that you have a body. And so using your identity, your body, your time to do something is to do something spiritual, right? Is totally Saturn and Pisces, you know, among the other things that will be happening. And I don't know if you guys saw this, but I was really curious about the Nobel Prize winners this past year in October um, for physics had proven oh, yeah. that time is non-local or, or, or that the universe is not local, right? That's what he was saying. He was saying that mathematically they pro proved, I think this is what he was saying. I haven't like done the math and probably won't. <laughs> So fun, but um, but basically like, we're not here. Well, that we are here, but that our consciousness is what dictates the experience of time and location. Right. So that that age old question of like, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it or see it, right? Did it really happen? Um, this has some, it's not a distinct answer to that necessarily, but there's, a co-participation of consciousness. Now, of course, everything has consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, so it's I'm so like glad you brought that up, though. I think that's I think that's the most important thing you brought up right now, as far as a uh, just to kind of reiterate that consciousness is non-local. So, it's like it's like we're here, but it's like we're projecting our consciousness here. I don't know. It's very yeah, how, okay. I think I can. I think I can make more sense of it, but this is my <laughs> subjective view as someone that does distance energy work for people right. where I'm using tuning forks, I'm using sound, yet they don't even need to be able to hear it. We don't yeah. even necessarily need to be on a call. So there's nothing physical happening there. So how I look at it is like energy is consciousness. Everything has consciousness that has energy. And then the, the, the quality of that consciousness has to do with the shape of its container, you could say. But, you know, the water is a perfect metaphor for this. 
there's water in your body. There's water in the atmosphere. There's water in the ocean. Is there separation between the water and you, the water in the air, the water in the ocean? Or is it one big continuum <laughs> with shapes that's making shapes within it? The way that if you like froze the water, you would see the crystals making different shapes and stuff, but it's one big body of water, even though it's frozen. So I think that that's kind of like what we're dealing with, the soup of consciousness. So saying it's non-local doesn't exactly mean the sense of like our consciousness isn't here, but it's projecting into here. In my opinion, yeah. I think I, it means more like that consciousness is beyond the dimension of right okay. here or there. So like back to the idea that this is that everything's mental, universe is mental. That means that everything's mental concepts like separation and distance are, are concepts illusion. they're not literal they're you know that's why i think that it, you're able to do stuff like long distance energy healing psychic stuff and all so that they're not because, there and i'm not here basically like, <laughs> it's everything's here there's only here so there's not here or there there's just here <laughs> if that makes right. sense yeah that's amazing i think okay. it also had to do with locationality being dependent upon conscious observation right right so, right okay okay so because of the quantum field and the the immediacy of connection when you create the correct quantum field connection it sounds like chance that you do that um easily with the beings that you do energy healing for and that's certainly how it works right when you do um it, yeah distance energy healing distance I would even argue distance tarot readings, right? You're you're tapping into them with their permission and you're consciously channeling their energy into an understanding. And you're also channeling other energies too, right? So it's it's interesting though that they proved that because I was like, oh yeah, yoga teaches this. So uh -huh. the day I read that, I walked into all my yoga classes like, great news, everybody. <laughs> the science they finally caught up to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I think that it, uh, it also kind of brings in that whole notion of entanglement and how, like, once again, everything you're connected to or, or desiring or envision is right here with you. It's not separate from you. So that's that's been a huge game changer the past few months for me um, and then helping me align more. And, yeah, I look forward to that. I feel like for better or for worse, uh, we'll see more people aligning more to who they are and where they come from and yeah they, bro you probably don't even realize all the levels of like quantum entanglement to for lack of a better phrase that you help people realize like i remember i don't know it was over a year ago <laughs> i was watching one of your streams and it was one of your like all right everybody we're doing a, a ritual of to manifest something we want or oh, yeah. and i didn't like have a specific thing i wanted so i just sort of i was like all right i just cleared my mind and let a vision come into my mind and i was like okay what i visualize is this what's going to happen and i had like a very specific almost sort of like dreamy nice. visualization of an interaction with somebody but well, i didn't know who it was but i like saw you know the colors they're wearing and kind of like their general look and like we had this interaction in my mind's eye and then after the ritual that you know we were co-creating with your stream uh i just like wrote down a date <laughs> And I, the at like midnight, the date that you that I wrote down, the exact thing that I saw in my mind's eye, because I was waiting for it. I was like, I had a post it note with the date on. I was like, this okay, what's gonna happen on this date? And then like the thing happened. It was not no exactly in the way I expected or 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 whatever, but like it was what I saw in my mind's eye. Wow. It was just what I saw in my mind's eye was fuzzy enough that like there's some fluidity to what it could have been, but yeah, yeah, it was wild. So um <laughs> <laughs> we have like everything is already here in the room with us, including like, you know, what's going to what is on June 16th, 2025 is right here in the room with you. If you can like clear your radio and like, uh, you know, uh, as my buddy Topher says all the time, frequency is location. So like freq this is back to what I was talking about with the extinction events, for people in the city versus people living in nature. Yeah, You know, if you're <laughs> in this sort of frequency cage of the uh, the urban environment, um, you know, that's that locate your personal biofield frequency is 
the location that you're in. Uh, it's not yeah. like we're moving through physical time and space. And that's kind of one of the problems with the Nobel Prize, Mathy, trying to figure out the nuts and bolts connection to everything, mm-hmm. you know, phrases like quantum entanglement, which is you're sort of, you're trying to materialize. The, yeah. This is how this connects to that. And this is where all the parts go, but it's a little more, it's more fluid than that. <laughs> you know, yeah. things are more fluid than that. I agree. And I, in, that, I, in that sense, they're more, they're all like one soup, all connected. A soup. I like that. A vibrational soup. And and that's one thing I've been really learning to just accept and relax. Cause I always feel like, I think it's the moon and cap in me. Like, I feel like I got to control everything or do everything and learning to really accepting that like everything is already here. Every single possibility. Uh, you just have to literally tune into and bring it into your force feel your frequency your your vortex um but it that was a huge game changer just accepting that you know and and that makes you not feel like you take more inspired action instead of feeling like oh i have to make this happen i have to do that it's like literally uh, aligns you so i've been having fun with that i wanted to you know cut all the way back to something you said at the beginning about spiritual cliches that you walk yeah. into uh can you expand on on whatever it is that you referred to there it's a lot of stuff that i heard in the beginning of my journey that you know i've heard for years and every time i would hear i wouldn't want to hear it I, that's not the that's not what i wanted to hear you know or you know it's stuff that i would believe but i would just feel like okay like that's a cliche though like that's that's what we all say you know what i mean like um everything you want is within you you know what i mean or like you just got to believe in yourself stuff like that it's stuff that like i never disagreed with but i never really understood like i thought i understood until it just smacked me in the face and like all of this stuff like kind of came back and it's like wow like the king of heaven really is a thing like you really do just have to believe yourself like life really is what you make it your thoughts do create reality and you know it's something that now is taking on so much more of a reality than just it's like a lot of that was just conceptual is now real for me a lot more i'm just noticing a lot more too and i'm grateful how are you working with that spiritual cliche of uh, thoughts creating reality, Emily? Well, I just, I think everything Michael just said was awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, always. And I very, yes. But I, love, I just loved the way you put it because it is true that sometimes things mm-hmm. come up again and again and you're, you know, circumstantially you might know it conceptually and then it happens to you in a new way or with something you really deeply desire and you're like oh right and you know i think the most beautiful thing to me that you just said was about how we are in a closed system you know everything that ever was or will be is already present in this field and so it's not it's not from a place of grasping that we look for this new age to come or that we dread the moment we're in, or we look at the past, like those people were so whatever, doing whatever they were, but that we can sit right here, right now, not necessarily look to other people for better or worse, you know, whatever they're adding or taking away or causing in us, but to just sit with yourself, you can really, um, find so much and you'd be surprised what comes to you from from just meditating right or just Mm, that's true and you know it's like kind of a shortcut it's not something i recommend to people but in where i got to this where i'm at now definitely big gateway was psychedelics and i had (laughs) everything that exists and ever will or has is in this field already like you just said i love how you put that I remember having psychedelic experiences where, you know, I'd be like in a, in a group of people or, you know, like a small concert venue or something and realizing that every sliver of being that I was familiar with and had encountered in my life journey, every person I knew, every type of person that existed, like I would run into them 
in this group of strangers, this field of people in a, at like a concert while I was, you know, on LSD or something. Uh, and I would like literally just meet somebody that would be exactly like, look like them and everything and put off a feeling like somebody that I knew well. And I realized that like, wherever I am, whatever space I'm in, uh, whether it's a f- just me or three people or a thousand people that everybody I know and everything that I've ever known is in that space. So that's like what I'm trying to explain earlier with aperture. So like when you're, when you narrow your aperture down to just self and just meditating and going within you actually, it's like a shortcut to really get to the, the full, it's like the, you know, you, when you narrow it in, you actually expand it out. It's like this paradox, if that all makes sense. And in the same way that like when I, um, that you never need to feel cut off or separated from anybody that like maybe leaves their body, you know, ends their life ends or leaves your life for whatever reason, because like whatever energy, whatever archetype they represent from your angle on the, on the monad, <laughs> you know, like it's going to come back around in the form of another being that like holds that energy. Cause the energy never left the field. It was right. always there. Yeah, that's true. Which is why it's also like totally safe to let go of people that we have attachments to if they're if it's hurting us to be in that form of attachment. Mm. Like, you know, I, I like to say that uh, <laughs> you don't even have to cut people out or cut people off like you just change. And then uh, the people that you let, can let go of in terms of the attachment mentally or like that I need them, you know, if they're they might fall away or they might come with you in the upgraded form. But if they don't, you will find them down the path later around the corner and it will be like the same exact energy, but in a new form. And like, I have had this literally happen (laughs) in very direct ways. Like a friend that I kind of broke off contact with because, you know, I didn't, you know, they were representing a version. They were representing like a perspective of like a part of myself that was like, you can't do that. You can't, (laughs) <laughs> you can't do your dream, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And they were kind of putting that energy on me. And I was like, Oh, this is the part of me that I'm holding on to that doesn't believe that it's okay or allowed for me to like have what I want in life. So I kind of just sort of let that friend fall to the side. Like, I didn't like cut them out. I just stopped, you know, engaging and stopped being attached to needing to be friends with them. And then like, this was a very specific friend. They were like, you know, he was like six, seven and he had like blonde hair and I uh, was kind of skinny and like talked a certain way. And like um, a week, maybe later, I made a new friend who was someone who was listening to my show very early in the show, like handful of listeners years ago. And this friend was like, I want to come visit you. I don't live that far away. And he brought me a piece of equipment that I needed for my show that I didn't have. And he was like the same height, wow. same build, uh, talk similarly, uh, and their names were close. They weren't the same name, but I was like, this is exactly what I, you know, I didn't realize the later in retrospect, but this is exactly like what I am trying to describe now that like you let go of this one version of the energy, it comes back around in an upgraded form, sometimes like immediately. Like yeah, yeah. I, I have stories myself. It's just very mind blowing once you kind of accept that down to the name too like it's ridiculous and birthday and all that <laughs> uh could we laugh at this comment <laughs> that guy is a dealer really <laughs> that's a good one uh, word yep really the best dealer of them all <laughs> <laughs> well, someone asked like right at the beginning why you picked that name mm-hmm. um you know i guess i don't know um the inspiration was actually like being a drug dealer um because i consider what we do a certain form of contraband since especially you know 10 years ago when i started doing this you couldn't really talk as freely as you could without being seen as like alien weird and uh you know uh there's certain to this day, like what's the word 
merchandise merchants who consider what we do risky business as to, in terms of like a psychic arts or stuff like that too. So that's kind of how I wanted to frame it. Like I, I'm no different than a drug dealer. I'm just pushing peace instead of like drugs or like hard drugs. So yeah. Did you get burned by Stripe and their policy? Yeah. Again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Oh my God. I was so angry. I was like, oh. I fought so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing strongly worded emails. Right. It's like, you know, you would think, I don't know. I just felt gaslighted. Like I was some <laughs> kind of scammer. Yeah. Well, peace is the best. You guys were getting it. blocked by payment processors before it was cool. You're right. Like now it's trendy. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. Thank God PayPal wasn't on some bougie stuff. But. Square is good too. Oh, okay. Good to know. Yeah, okay. I got on with their customer service agent. I was like, so, because they'll they can take subscription recurring payments. So if you have something like that, nice. um, I got on with those customer service people, and I was like, so this is exactly what I do. Can I take payment? <laughs> Surprising. Right. Yeah. No, that was a very. Uh, it's very surprising. I'll say that. Sneakies. Yeah. So one thing about, you know, when we're looking at a new year, one thing that can be interesting to consider is the, uh, in the Mayan calendar, the 1320 dream spell, if you will. I don't know what the proper name for it. Jose Aguila, Aguila lab. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> I like that, uh, that system. I don't know it deeply, but it's always hit whenever people have talked about it with me on the show. They have a, a setup of like, you know, there's multiple types of cycles you could look at. The Chinese calendar has got the 60 years before you're back into another water rabbit. So we could look at what was 60 years ago. But they have in the Galactic Mayan calendar a 52 year cycle before you come back around to sort of the, the beginning of the deck again. And that would mean you could look at some of the major events of 52 years ago and then 52 years before that. And 52 years before that is like, possible mm, fractal mirroring of what may be up for you know the possibilities in 2023 so i mean there's a lot that happens in a year so maybe people uh in the chat can hit us with some of the interesting things in those 52 year cycles but the 1919 well 104 years ago you had the collapse of the habsburg and german empires find that interesting right <laughs> and uh 1971 would have been 52 years ago and we had disney world opens <laughs> i don't know those are just like some quick google searches but i uh, would love to hear people find some of the interesting stuff going on there just before the spanish flu shannon says and also you know if anyone has questions that they uh in the last segment here want to hit the uh, astrologers with please drop them in the chat and we'll see what we can get into <laughs> and if you guys have you two have any you know hanging dangling chads from previous threads you know i'd be curious to hear <coughs> mm. or questions for each other oh, oh nice i know you Michael, said tell us about oh <laughs> no you're i know you said your rising was cancer what, what's your sun sign capricorn no way. Oh, that's awesome. How about you? Uh, Gemini. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. What kind of Gemini? What's, what's the date? Um, yeah, I'd like to ask you too. Mine is uh, on the 11th, so it's 20 degrees Gemini. Yeah. Taurus rising. For like us laymen. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh what's interesting about the 20th degree uh 20 degrees is the third decade sub ruled by crazy uranus or or super weird uranus so we're like the um revolutionary gemini's i like to think or the super crazy ones but the june gems but yeah 
And it's a Scorpio degree point of Gemini. So, oh. um, right. According to degree theory, right? The 20th right. degree is an interesting 20th. degree point. Good Leads to know. To psychic nature, energy direction, potential. Sounds like you're working with it. Sounds oh, like dude. Connected. Michael is super psychic. Oh, appreciate you. <laughs> no, it's, it's real. No, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look more into degree theory. That's definitely been interesting. That guy was interesting. I think he passed away, but he's he was, I want to say, Eastern European. Was he like? I think so. I heard he was. Remarkable. Okay, so Robo Honky says, how does a rising sign affect a person? <coughs> I know that one. I think it's like how you come across to the world, right? Maybe sort of like what you grow into. What else, What do you guys think? To your embodiment and your title. So I've learned to take that so much more serious. But if like the sun is, uh, if the moon is who you are at your core and your subconscious, and then your sun is how you express what's inside your moon sign, then your rising sign is how you embody all that and dress. How's, what's your, how do you wear your personality relative to your spirit? So then, like as a Leo rising, that's why I'm a main character. Yeah, right, right. That's the title too, right? So it's going to be before you just, I've learned, I learned you can use your moon to describe your sun or your sun to describe your moon, but the rising is going to be the title before you do that. The royal this or the goat that or, you know should be interesting what do you think about the idea of born at night your moon sign is kind of more the way people look at your sun and born during the day your sun sign is more the prominent one i want to research i actually want to do a case study on that um and research that like a double blind study and and see because I, I think we're in a position to do experiments like that that'll reveal so much but i i think there's truth to it i, I would just really like to know that's a really good question I think there's truth to it, especially if you were born at night and the moon was out. If you're born during a new moon, you still might be more associated with your sun sign or your rising sign. Mm, um, but deep. there is there is a theory that um, gender has something to do with it too, um, embodiment of gender and the thing that you identify with most, right? Do you identify with your externally moved radiance and the source place of light, or do you identify more with your subconscious nature? Like people who identify, you'd be an interesting one actually to ask about this, Michael, because yeah. remember, I thought you were a Capricorn. I was like Capricorn energy, but your sun is in general, moon's in Capricorn. And you said, did you say your rising sign was Taurus? Taurus, yeah. So two very moony, placements in your big three and and you and then chance just said that you're quite psychic right and psychicness is something associated with the moon and so it's interesting I, and i don't know if you well if you were born so you would have been born when the sun was down yeah i was born uh 3 57 a.m like right before dawn but it was definitely, I'm pretty sure it was night during that period. Like it was right before the sun came up. It would have to be right because Taurus and then, right? Yeah. My, yeah. yeah, I'm like geometry. No, you're right. I wonder how much of you, because that's something I want to study too, like especially just researching the Capricorn sun archetype. I wonder how much of you seeing that is because your sun's awareness could see like, could just sense the, the moon, you know what I mean? But like, yeah, just, just been wanting to research that. Sun a lot moon of astrologers up in. Up Whoa, in. What was that, Emily? I said a lot of Capricorn astrologers. Interesting. Well, you guys are obsessed with the rules. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. That's all right. I love it. <laughs> We're either obsessed with building something or with ancient remembering. We go one way or the other. And it's not like the Virgos are going to do it. They already know. They don't <laughs> They don't need to figure it out. I love it. 
funny. They already figured it out. <laughs> they were just born knowing. They just had it in them already. <laughs> they were like, speed limit is 45 miles per hour. I go exactly 45 miles per hour. Oh, okay. So like I had dinner on Wednesday nights a lot. I have dinner with my family, like my mom, my dad, my sister, um, my, my sweet lady. And uh, my sister's a Virgo. And I don't even know how she sees it, but she's like, like I'm cooking and doing stuff in the kitchen and she's pregnant right now. So she's like, gets to just chill. And like every three minutes or something, she's like, you just did this. Go wash your hands. I saw that. Go wash your hands. And she's oh, like, <laughs> how do they like, do that? They just know. Yeah, that's why. No, because you really think they won't know, but they really <laughs> do. It's like a sixth sense. Like, it's so funny. <laughs> But like at least the Virgos I know they're they're funny about it too. So you know it, it's hilarious. Get a lot of laughs out of it. I guess it's because the truth is funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Gordy wants to know if you're bringing back the costumes. Yeah. Um, what does I mean, he mean by that? You have any, uh, any on hand? I I have a couple wigs. And then I have a moon costume. Yeah, I'm definitely bringing it back. I just want to uh, kind of upgrade my production first so it could be more organized. I guess that's the cap of me. But yeah, good question. Oh, this is a good one from Shannon. She wants to know what influence does astrology have over dreams? So I think that like maybe my answer to that would be definitely certain transits might affect certain people with dreaming harder right oh yeah it's like the weather it's really just like the star weather so I, it would suggest that during certain transits maybe some people are more susceptible than others um and it can influence the type of dreams you'll have but of course it will it'll be different for everyone but that's a really good question and neptune rules the dream state too so for example last april i think we had neptune conjoining jupiter and you saw a lot of people really getting excited about a spiritual awakening for everybody, but not realizing that a lot of the spiritual awakening was occurring in the dream state at that oh, time. That's deep. So that's very deep. Yeah. She says, Shannon says, mine have always been crazy. Ancestors, giants, caves, messages from people who've passed other worlds, other beings, bridges to the heavens and portals. Mm -hmm. And I want to <laughs> just hear some stories from you. Yeah, That'll be So, yeah, that sounds like something that should be taken to if she if she has like a, a trusted shaman or a teacher. Sometimes because when I've had weird dream things, I go straight to my my schools to be like, excuse me. What's happening here? <laughs> Actually, you probably have Neptune in Capricorn, right? I do. Yeah, see, I definitely wanted to research specifically Capricorn men, and, but specifically women with that placement, because I'm under the impression that y'all are the most powerfully psychic people alive. Um, I think there's some kind of supernatural quality to that that I've been really wanting to. And and it takes literally 30 to 33 years to awaken, too. So I Neptune can, and Cap? Yeah. Dude, I, I don't know. I'm not a woman, but at around 32 years old, my psychic uh, abilities went through the roof. I've got I'm Neptune in Cap. It, it squares you. So I feel like the square to your son is significant too. it. You, you just harness it in a more direct way versus, uh, well, well, Capricorn too. But like, yeah, I don't know. I know that was like about when I started tuning people with the, I, the forks and like while I'm doing that. It's super crazy. I'll just be like, you know, I'm literally waving tuning forks around in my living room. And then I'll be like, okay, you were, I just saw a vision in my mind. It was like something bad happening to uh, one of your pets. And you're like a six year old. And they're like, yep, this happened. And yeah, that's lit. So I, I need to look into that too. Cause I've, I've never been, the reason why I want to start with the conjunction is it applies to the Libra square, the Aries square, the, the, the cancer opposition, you know. But I feel like that's it, to be honest. Like, I, I want to look into that. And so, yeah, all power <laughs> to you. 
I just told my membership group today, I was like, I'm not going to get into Neptune and Capricorn because I was like, I have a lot of personal feelings about it. I think about it a lot in my personal chart, not to out myself, but it conjoins my descendant and it also conjoins wow. the fixed star faces, right? Which is in, in Sagittarius, right? Because of the difference between sidereal and tropical time. Right. And that placement is nuts. <laughs> It took me probably a long time to figure out how nuts that placement was and how many. Neptune DC in Cap uh, is, is, I've been looking at too as a Cancer rising. I've, I've always felt that is like, you literally can read people's body language and feel what they're feeling in a certain way. But just like, they just reveal who they are. I, I can imagine that's incredible because your son's there too. So like, wow, that's awesome. It's a weird place. Yeah. <laughs> JLo says, seeing is one of the hardest things to turn off. I did a tuning session for JLo one time, and her third eye energy was bigger than any chakra energy of any chakra that I'd ever seen ever. Wow. I was like, how do you live like this? <laughs> She's That's wild. Super psychic. Uh, <laughs> another cool question. I like this question. Um, it was longer, but I'm just going to maybe condense it down. They wanted to know if there's any above energies <laughs> that might amplify our ability to discern between phony happiness and real happiness. So like, you know, I'm guessing, I'm sure you guys can kind of like figure out what is meant by that. Cause there yeah. are definitely times in our life where we thought we were happy, but then we realized we we're just lying to ourselves and like, you know, what would help us, what might be coming that maybe help us discern between that or not. I don't know. I or maybe feel there's it. like, we have this, we have this, I mean, this isn't exactly astrology, but, Watch right. out for, you know, the temptation of um, excess. That's not real happiness. Yeah. So True discernment that. is tied to protection. So if someone's trying to discern um, in life, you need to first protect and ground yourself. So, for example, like spiritual people, right? Well, oftentimes we meditate or something and we're like, cool, I'm floating in the ether. You know, there's a dream state. I'm dissipating my aura basically into this other field so I can connect with these other energies. Um, the problem, I mean, that's great. You know, it's fun. And if you're concerned about discernment or you're worried that the happiness you think you have is not the right happiness, or if you're, if you're prone to experiences where you have kind of rose colored glasses initially, and then you realize later you need to back step. Um, oh, that wasn't what I thought it was, whatever it is. The key is, um, is that protection force. And so from, from in an energetic way, right? So grounding your body and, and really recognizing, like sometimes people get all excited about, I don't know, going like, going to like these space spacious places, going outside the body, astral projection. But the the real miracle of life is being in a body. Like how'd you get so lucky to be here in this? And that's where you'll find your true discernment is in, in the physical body. And it'll get clearer the more you give your body healthy things. And that's not just food and exercise, that's, you know, ample rest. Um, that's, you know, whatever practices you do to create a sense of well-being with nervous system reset. Oh, that is so on the money, Emily. I really like how you put that because first of all, yeah, our body's the detection system of whether or not we're actually authentically content or satisfied. It has a lot to do with the sacral chakra energy where, you know, there's like a polarity in the sacral chakra, particularly on the right side of it, of like frustration or satisfaction. <laughs> and that's more like the front and then the back that's supporting that is like, does it feel good to be in our body? Like the default baseline state of sensing into our, our body, Does is it a good feeling or is it painful or is it numb? Like that's sort of the range. And, um, you know, in a healthy balanced state of being on all dimensions, psychological and physical, then it feels great to be in your body. And so that's a really good metric. And then I think in terms of the space weather uh, correlation to this idea of authentic happiness versus sort of like phony happiness, as he put the question or, or she, 
<laughs> Saturn in Pisces, man. <laughs> like, are we putting the kibosh, the finality on escapism? Are we grounding our, are we grounding our sort of uh, pleasures and, and all that? Uh, well, you know, maybe there's something to the Saturn in Pisces that will either be like a, you win, you graduate, <laughs> or um, you're gonna be forcibly made to desist from whatever it is that's your fake happiness, maybe. Yeah. With Saturn, you can build yourself a palace or a prison, right? So you can create the container that you need to let go, or you can create a prison for yourself in which you can't let go or in which you have to let go, right? Some people will build that with Saturn and Pisces. They'll create a circumstance for themselves where they're forced to release things that their soul wants out of them, but that they're really, and it'll be suffering, but there's another form where you consciously you're like, I'm making the container for my own release, right? For my yeah. own channel. Um, get foot massages. That's my advice. Oh yeah. Just that should be actually amazing. Give them or get them or both. Get them or give them to yourself or give them to others. Be nice, right? Share. <laughs> Get really good at it. Reflexology, knowing knowing the organ stat stances, or just poke at your feet till you realize where the party is. <laughs> I did that. I did that just the, like two days ago. I was like, started working on my foot, and I was like, "This is amazing. Why do I want to do this more often?" I make people massage their feet in yoga all the time. They're used to it, but. <laughs> Yo, know, so uh, you know, we're gonna move towards the wrap up, but I want to check in with you, Michael. Um, what's new? You know, are you working on any new music? Have you put out anything extracurricular that's interesting? Is there anything you're excited about you want to like keep people into that's coming up or has just you know become available that you're involved in? Definitely working on a lot of new projects, um, just reconstructing how I do everything, but yeah um i'm i felt like i had to rush a lot of things but now i'm really taking my time which is cool uh and just focusing more on alignment and and assisting others in that as well so looking forward to that for sure um i i think i'll be able to get a bunch of stuff ready by spring and then launch all that then and and then true new year so we'll see that would be fun. Cool, man. And Emily, um, remind us the book is uh, what one twenty three, right? Yeah. Well, and what's it called? One two three. So if it's not out one two three, just expect it in the next couple of days. It's called Astro Yoga for an Aquarian Age. Oh, that's awesome. That and sounds like a book. It should be cool. Um, I think it has a lot of good information if you want to learn like energetic understanding of the zodiac prep yourself to read charts and then start to apply this to your energy and your physical body. Um, so you've probably heard me talk about our Lord and savior at the liver cleanse before, but you know, all the things, it doesn't teach you how to cleanse your liver, but um, you will be like, Oh, my liver's connected with Sagittarius. And isn't it interesting that all the fire signs are the seats of the soul and various societal constructs. Anyway, it's a good time. Um, you mean I like think. the pineal gland, the liver for like pineal gland for Aries, liver for Sag, and then Leo is a heart. Mm, that's yeah, deep. well, and Aries is the entire brain, right? So when we talk about where our soul is, oh, we're like, is it in our mind? Is that the soul? Or the heart, right? Where's the seat of human consciousness? And and some of, I think it was the ancient Greeks sometimes would say it was in your liver. And so these are the. Yeah the areas that's, that's a question i've been asking is is this uh or i've been pondering is the soul act because i learned that the seat of your soul is the third eye and so i was like is your soul in your brain because i always used to think or assume it was like this tantian area but i've been kind of learning to yeah i've been kind of pondering that so i appreciate you mentioning that that's very 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 interesting very interesting. it's it's neat yeah i, I agree it's, it's cool stuff so yeah that's coming out 
Um, if anybody wants to study astro yoga or just astrology with me, I have an ongoing membership. We have a 2023 guide coming out this week. That's fun. And yeah, I'm just here on the internet, <laughs> but mostly person. Cool guys. Uh, really appreciate y'all hanging out with me tonight and it's been a fun one and definitely people check out emilyridout.com you can find that linked in the show notes watch out for her new book i'm sure we'll talk to her about it um not too far down the line again she's a pretty regular <laughs> feature here on the vibrant which i love and i appreciate and michael it's been cool hanging out with you too brother i always appreciate your time i know that you are just like uh kicking ass and crushing charts all the time so <laughs> thanks for hanging out with us dude yeah i appreciate you having me Cool guys. Um, and we'll I'm gonna go hang out over on the uh the Weaving Spiders Web's YouTube channel tonight for their flow state where we're gonna read books to each other and make art. So nice. uh, you know, get on our telegram chat if you wanna make sure you catch links to that whenever we do it. And for everybody else, I'll see you for um oh, actually I wanna go ahead and announce it. Sunday night. We have Marty Leeds on Interverse Podcast. We're going to be talking about his new book, Scripture in the Stars, which kind of does feel appropriate to uh, announce because he's going to be releasing this book soon that is all about the biblical stories and how they are allegories for the constellations and what the sky clock does. So I need that book. That's what's up. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, you, you, if you're interested, I got lots of content about that astrotheology stuff. It's my jam, dude. That's awesome. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Much love, everyone. Thanks for being here. The chat has been excellent. You guys are great. Love each other. Be good. Ground. Massage your feet. You know, do all that stuff. And uh, good night, everyone. Good night.